On the road to the White House earlier this week, Ohio Governor John Kasich spoke at a house party in Bedford, New Hampshire. We'll hear his remarks first, then his greetings with voters and a brief news conference. I'll tell you what, we'll just make this like a jump rope. Turn it when salt, pepper, however that thing went. How about our host and hostess? Can we give them a great round of applause? And um, I understand they lured you all here because everyone here is going to get a canned ham when you get ready to leave. Um, and they have a beautiful, how about this, huh? And if I'm president, everybody's going to have a backyard just like this, okay? <laughs> and uh, listen, I was here uh, years ago, and uh, he told a little story about the sled dog, as I did go sled dog whatever, racing, I almost I thought I was going to drown. But a, but a more interesting story than that was I was, uh, don't remember exactly where I was, but I was in this house and I was talking to this lady and we were standing at the sink and uh, it was going great. And I'm thinking, I've got myself a town captain here. There is just no question about this. And then after about 20 minutes, she looked at her watch and she said, when do you think the candidate's going to get here? That's when I knew it was time to go back to Ohio. So uh, a little bit different this time. I want to uh, thank you all for coming. J maybe just a short bio, and I'd really like to, uh, to be able to take your questions. So I, I do come from Pittsburgh. My father carried mail, and uh, his father was a coal miner. My, my, mother's, uh, my mother was a, a very smart lady, but very undereducated. She was highly opinionated. And, um, her mother lived with us off and on, and she could barely speak English. And the town where I grew up, uh, I don't really remember, except for one guy that lived catty corner to us, I never remember seeing a white shirt. Everybody that lived in this town had a blue collar, and uh, virtually everybody that lived in my hometown was a Democrat. I mean, we just didn't have Republicans living there. And it was a conservative, kind of God-fearing, uh, common-sense town. But if the wind blew the wrong way, uh, people found themselves out of work. And I was talking to a gentleman here whose father was the uh, he was the postmaster in downtown Pittsburgh. Apparently had he apparently had a lot of say in the whole area. Um, and the reason I bring that up is that I never I was never aware of us getting sort of special things, you know. Uh, we never got a ticket to go see the World Series. We never got a ticket to go see the playoff games. I can't hardly remember of whether we ever got even got a ticket to go see the Steelers play because we just didn't have those kind of connections. And I haven't talked much about this, but I learned as a kid kind of to fight for the underdog. I kind of learned as a kid to stick up for people who a lot of times nobody ever sticks up for. And that's kind of burned into my soul. That doesn't mean that people who are really successful like Rich need to be torn down. And I can remember my father saying to me one time, Johnny, um, we don't hate the rich, we wanna be the rich. And um, so my values were sort of shaped in that, in that little town. And, um, and I really kind of carried it through my whole lifetime. My mother was very opinionated and um, and I, I learned a lot from her because she was somebody who really, she'd shake it up. Uh, my mother was a change agent, and it's just a shame she didn't have the education because of what she could have done. And my parents always kind of planted in, I'll tell you a really interesting story. The one thing I wanted to be when I was a little boy is I wanted to play on the Little League team. I was a pretty good ball player, but I was a little skinny little guy that would be easy to ignore. And when you try out for the baseball team, you put a number on your back. It's not like baseball teams today where everybody gets a trophy, whether they play, make the team, win or not. Back then, you put a number on your back and you'd just run out in the field. And when I think back to when I was 10 or 11 years old, my glove was probably bigger than me. And so what would happen is you'd go out and you'd take batting practice and you'd field. And it would go for, I don't know, maybe a day or two. And then the coaches would write your number down and then they would call you and tell you you were on the baseball team. I never got a call. I never got a call. 
And I said to my dad, I said, Dad, um, the, a lot of the kids at the schoolyard, they're on baseball teams, but they're really, they don't play as well as I do. Uh, but their dads are like coaches and they know somebody. Could you talk to somebody and get me on the baseball team? And you know what my dad said? Johnny, you're going to earn it because we're not going to owe anybody anything. Think about that for a second. What a powerful statement that was to a 11, you know, 10, 11 year old boy. And that's kind of how I've conducted myself in public life. If you help me, if you support me, if you give me something, it doesn't get you anything special. I'll know you and I'll respect you and I'll listen to you, but nobody calls the tune on John Kasich. Nobody. Maybe the Lord is the one that calls, not maybe, but he'd call the tune on me. And maybe, and no doubt about it, my wife, okay? But out of that, <laughs> and um, so when you combine the sense of sticking up for people whose voices are not always heard, and you combine that with the sense that people should have the right to be able to grow and become something big, the old Johnny, we don't hate the rich, we want to be the rich. And when you think about my mother being a very independent voice and person, um, it's made me into sort of a, I guess in some ways, a different kind of a, of a public official. Uh, I moved to Ohio and, and uh, I went to Ohio State and uh, while I don't ever mince my words, I was in Michigan today, and I, I didn't really get all that excited to tell them I went, graduated from Ohio State. No, I told them. They know. Um, but I left Ohio, went to Ohio State, and a lot of wonderful things happened. And some of you have heard my stories of how I started in life. And, um, you know, I feel like I've been struck by lightning, and I feel as though uh, I've had some blessings to be able to take the skills that I have and use them uh, to try to do some good. Because my mother and father always said, make sure that wherever you are, that the place is a little bit better because you were there. So I've always kind of subscribed to that. Um, I was first elected to public office uh, as, as a, a very young man. I started running at about, I was about, oh, I don't know, maybe 24 and a half, 25 years old. I knew no one in my Senate district. Now this, the legislature in Ohio is, uh, you know, we have 11 and a half million people. I represented 350,000, which is almost the same number as a, as the United States congressman. And when I ran, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody in the Republican Party, to tell you the truth, because I've been working in the legislature. But you know what I did? I recruited, like the women that are standing here with these one shirts on. And I would go to their home and talk to them and ask them if they would help me. And we really created a volunteer army, which is what I always like to say, that when I run for office, it's not a campaign, it's more of a movement. And, um, and I won. It was a shocking win. No one ever would have expected me to win because I ran against a guy who was almost a household word, and I got in there. I was 26 years old, the youngest state senator ever in Ohio history. And I served for four years. And there was a couple things going on. One is, uh, I was in the minority for two years, and in my third year, I was in the majority. But the House was Democrat, so I had to figure out, am I a Republican or am I an Ohioan? And um, I figured, uh, you know, first and foremost, a conservative. I didn't want to raise any taxes, and, and you know, I, I wanted to make the government as small as I could. It just made total sense to me. And that comes from my blue-collar background, where if things are big, they don't work very well. And so um, I had to learn how to work with people in the other party to get things done. And then after those four years, I ran for Congress. In 1976, I was working as an aide in the legislature before I was elected. And I was a fan of Ronald Reagan. I mean, a rabid fan of Reagan. I mean, I went door to door to get Reagan on the ballot in Columbus, Ohio, knocking on people's doors at like, it, we were running out of time. It's like midnight, I'm paying, and they're like furious with me. I said, look, look, you can be mad at me. Just sign this petition to get Ronald Reagan on the ballot. That's all I care about. So the convention occurred, and one of the senators I was working for was in the Reagan Brain Trust. And, um, he called me one day and he said, I'm really, really busy out here. Could you fly out to Kansas City? I need help. And when I got there, I went into the trailer where the brain trust was. These are people who are trying to get delegates to vote for Reagan. 
And when I walked in, they said somebody didn't show up. And we have, we wonder if you could manage five delegations in the country to help Reagan become president. I had no idea what that meant, but I said, absolutely, I could do it. And so I had an opportunity at that convention to travel with Ronald Reagan, actually to go to delegations and to introduce him. I'm 24 years old, you know? So I was steeped in that from the beginning. So then I ran for Congress after that state Senate uh, uh, effort. Let me not leave this out. So we get in the majority, and guess what the Republicans want to do? They want to raise taxes. So I'm against it. I said I made a promise I wouldn't support a tax increase. So my colleagues started calling me names in a newspaper. I've never even told th these kind of stories before. Um, and they were calling me irresponsible. I said, so you think I'm irresponsible? Well, then I'll write my own budget. That was the first time I wrote a budget. I was uh, 28 years old. And I wrote a budget for Ohio to close the uh, deficit so we didn't have to raise taxes. So uh, the budget gets defeated, obviously. And, but, you know, I had some good ideas. And people would sneak into my office late at night to tell me where there was waste in the government. It was great. But I learned something there. If you know the budget, you know how government works. And you got more knowledge than anybody else will have. So then I go, I run for Congress, and I run with Reagan in 1982. I'm the only Republican to defeat an incumbent Democrat in America that year. And I ran on the Reagan tax cuts and smaller government and, and to be able to defeat the Soviet Union. As President Reagan used to say, what's his philosophy on the Soviet Union? We win, they lose. Okay, it's pretty simple. So I go down there and I start my service on the Armed Services Committee, learning about defense. Became a defense reformer because I was found the hammers and the screwdrivers and the wrenches that cost tens of thousands of dollars, and some of you remember that. And uh, it was a little uncomfortable to be a defense report, a reformer and a Republican, but it was the right thing to do. And then six years in, I became, I uh, got on the Budget Committee. And I went to my first budget committee meeting and uh, didn't like what was going on. I mean, I'm a conservative, right? I want to balance budgets. And so that year, my first year on the committee, I offered my own budget, the Kasich budget. And the vote on that budget that year was 405 no and 30 yes. And I thought I was doing great. And um, so I offered a budget year after year after year. Now let me just explain a little bit to you about how this works, because my great friend, John Sununu. I love John and Kitty. I would not be running for president today if John Sununu had not come to me and said, I think you should do this. It wouldn't happen. So back in those days, I became the senior Republican, then the budget committee chairman. And what we did is we broke up into groups. So I would take four or five members of the committee and I would assign them to an area to study, research, and fix. Then I'd take another group and I would ask them, and here's where the ground rules. You need to look at all these programs. If they don't work, we're going to get rid of them. If they don't work and you can fix them, we'll fix them. If they can be privatized, we'll privatize them. And I want you to think outside the box. Don't think like you work in the government. Think like you work in business and come up with a better mousetrap. And here's the other ground rule. Nobody but nobody has influence over you. You, do, you can talk to people, you can consult with people, but at the end of the day, it's an intellectually honest exercise. And let the chips fall where they may. And we did that. And then in 1997, we landed on the first balanced budget since man had walked on the moon. We paid down the largest amount of the, of the, modern, of the modern debt that was held by the public, and we cut taxes on capital gains and the economy was doing great. In the meantime, I'm on the Defense Committee, so I have to make decisions about war, about resources to meet the threat that America has, and I work with some of the greatest minds in, in the hist modern history of the United States, from John Tower to John Stennis to Barry Goldwater. I mean, these were, these were giants. This was a time when Republicans, Democrats worked together because we were all Americans first, and it was a great experience. So I left Washington. I said, I'm done with this. I need to get out of town. I'm tired of all this stuff, and I want to go into the private sector. And um, so I worked at Lehman Brothers as an investment banker. I traveled all over America. A seminal experience for me because I learned how businesses work, 
and I really learned about how decisions get made. And then you remember what a big television star I was at Fox News. I mean, I was huge. And I did a bunch of other things, and then I felt called back into government. And I told my wife I was thinking about going back in, and my wife said, that's okay with me. It's just you'll be sleeping on the porch for the next four years. And uh, no, but she finally understood it, because I'll tell you what. The Lord has a purpose for all of us. Maybe you don't think that way. Maybe you're a humanist. And if you are, then you have a purpose for living, which is to improve the life of people around you. So I couldn't look the other way. So I went and ran for governor, and I was the first person to beat an incumbent in 36 years. And uh, for somebody who had never run statewide and had been out of politics for 10 years, nobody like that had been elected against an incumbent in 96 years. So it was a pretty good accomplishment. So I went to work with the same philosophy we had in Washington. We were $8 billion in the hole. We had lost 350,000 jobs. Our credit was going down the drain. People felt hopeless. So we put this program together. After the, my first year, I had a 28% approval rating. I was the most unpopular governor in America. you got to work hard to be that unpopular. And, um, but then we steadily started to feel some, the sun come up. So four and a half years later, we're no longer in debt. We have a $2 billion surplus. We've cut taxes by almost $5 billion, the largest amount of tax cuts in by any sitting governor in America. Uh, we, uh, we are up uh, over 330,000 jobs. Our credit is strong. And then one other thing I want to tell you. When we do better, everybody should do better. If you live in the shadows, if you're mentally ill, we're going to help you. We don't want you to be put in jail or in prison where we have 10,000 mentally ill people in our state, and it's in every state across this country. We need to help them get on their feet and become productive. If you're drug addicted, the revolving door of prison and drug dealer and prison and drug dealer, no more. We're going to treat you and we're going to rehab you and get you on your feet. If you're the working poor, we don't want you spending your time in the emergency room where you're sicker and more expensive. We want to make sure you get some decent health care. We want to make sure that if you're the working poor that you can continue to get pay raises without losing your child care. If you're developmentally disabled, you're special. We're going to mainstream you. If you're a member of the minority community, we're going to help you create entrepreneurship. You see, because I think being a conservative means opportunity for everybody. And somehow, somebody has put conservatives in a box. You know, being a conservative is about government as a last resort and not a first resort. And it's about letting people keep more in their pockets rather than sending it to somebody in a faraway place. It is about school choice. It's about uh, many, many things, about running America from the bottom up. But I think conservatism is also about having a big heart, about giving people an opportunity to live out their God-given purpose. That's what I think opportunity is about in America. I can tell you that's what it's about in my mind when I think back to McKee's Rocks and the opportunity. And one other thing I want to tell you here tonight. It's time that Americans stop being in a bad mood and complaining about things. We live in an unbelievable country. Do we have our problems? But why don't we get up tomorrow morning and why don't we count our blessings for having been born in the United States of America, okay? We have our problems, but they can be solved. And they can be solved because when we hang together, we've got real strength. We've got real purpose. If I become president, there's like three things that I would like to focus on right away. One is the issue of economic growth. Any public official that's worth their salt has to create an environment for job creation. And that means we've got to deregulate our society. We've got to give the companies incentives to move their profits back from Europe so they invest in America and not there. We need to give them incentives to invest in plant and equipment so the workers can have tools so they can be productive and get higher wages. We need, to, we need to work on workforce training so we train people for jobs that exist. 
we need to be in a position of where we look at this whole tax code and at least simplify it. There's so many things that we need to do to create economic growth, and a lot of it is an attitude. Secondly, we need to rebuild our defense. Uh, but we have to reform our Pentagon. It used to be, I'm told, it would take five or six years to research, development, and deploy a weapon system. Now it takes over 20 years. How about if I told you you're going to build a house? Don't worry, you'll be moving in in 20 years. It, we have to reform that building, but we also have to rebuild our military strength, because frankly, we're the leader of the world. Whether we know it, whether sometimes we like it, we are the leader of the world. And then finally, I think we need to reignite citizenship. What do I mean by that? I think we as, as Americans, as members of Western civilization, need to realize that we need to lead, lead a life that's bigger than ourselves. That's what the One Campaign's about. You lead a life that's bigger than you. And secondly, we all need to be centers of justice, centers of healing, so we can take care of our communities, so we can have a healthier society. You know, it, may, it doesn't sound like a campaign speech, does it? I think, I hope it sounds to you as something bigger. Because this is like rekindling the flame in our country. And we can do it. This is not that hard. Uh, sometimes the politicians won't be able to get it, but guess what? The people do. And I remember when old Ronald Reagan said, you write letters to Tip O'Neill, and he had more letters on his desk than in that movie, The Miracle on 34th Street, okay? And, we, and he made it clear, the people made it clear we want this done. Let's balance budgets, let's strengthen the economy, let's rebuild the defense, let's reignite citizenship, and let's be a leader of the world. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So. Yes, sir, in the back with the bright yellow shirt. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent words, and uh, they, really do, they really do resonate. No question about it. My wife and I have had the opportunity to meet with nine of the candidates. And to be honest with you, the words of those other candidates also resonate. You know, they all have their, their own story, all very, very powerful messages. And we appreciate that. How does Governor Kasich separate himself from the pack, differentiate himself to really rise above that pack and be memorable to this audience and audiences all over the United States? Is there, what is there special, what is there unique about John that you really want us to take home tonight? Well, I'm a marketing guy, well, I, so. I would, just, I would tell you a couple things. First of all, I'm, I'm just who I am. Okay, I'm not going to like put two ice cream cones in my mouth or take my shirt off or, you know, that's not what I'm going to do. And uh, my approach is that I'm going to do the best I can. And you got to listen. And if you like it, great. If you don't like it, I'll cry for 10 minutes and then my life will be okay. Um, we'll see. But there's one thing that I have that I think is unique. I've done all the things that I've talked about. This is, this is not about, you know, what I might do or what I think we ought to do. Did you ever notice when people run for president, they never keep their promises? It's because they make promises that are unrealistic or they make promises that simply can't be kept. We talk about balancing a budget. I've balanced many of them. We talk about expense, experience in defense. I have it. We talk about understanding what it means to be an executive in a very big state where there's challenges every day. I've lived it. So I think today people want us to acknowledge the anxieties that exist in this country, and I grew up with them. But I think at the end of the day, people want the plane to be landed. And I think the most powerful thing that I can offer you is to look at my past, because that will tell you what will happen in the future. And so, you know, it's experience, it's results, it's a record. And I think that's as about as, as well as I can do. Thank you very much, yes. sir. Appreciate it. Yes. The story that you told about your upbringing and where you are today is amazing and heartening. But it's one that is so inaccessible to an incredibly huge portion of the population today. Kids who had 
who today had the childhood that you had stand far less of a chance of being in the position that you're in today? What needs to happen at a policy level to close that opportunity gap? And how much of it is not in the hands of policymakers, but as you talk about in communities? Well, I think the American dream is alive today. I don't think my story is particularly unique. Everybody, as he pointed out, everybody has a story uh, about who they were. And so, I mean, what, what, is it that, what is it that we need? Well, first of all, we do need a growing economy. You know, growing economy means you have opportunity. If you go around knocking on doors and there's no jobs, it's pretty hard to find a job, right? So we need a growing economy, and I don't think the folks in Washington the president has not understood how you grow an economy. This is the weakest recovery in, uh, since World War II, uh, and it's just not been good. But secondly, I also think that I'm a big believer in, in, in mentoring. You see, I think when you tell somebody who's young, and maybe even somebody who isn't that young, what their potential is and encourage them for their dreams, it's amazing how you create a determination and a will to be able to do it. I mean, there's, there's like five values that I think are right now, there's many, but five that I consider to be really important in the country to teach our kids. One, personal responsibility. The dog ate my homework, went out in the fifth grade. Okay, you need to accept it. Secondly, resilience. You get knocked down, you pick yourself up. I love the line by Michael Vick, uh, you know, the quarterback. He said, you only have one chance to make a good second impression. I love, I love that. <laughs> Thirdly is the issue of empathy, which moves us to care about people who we want to see move up the ladder. And fourthly is family. Family is such an important part. I mean, look, if we don't have family in America, we don't have America, right? And we need to reemphasize it and understand its importance, and I think faith. Uh, I happen to believe that everybody on this earth was created for a purpose. And you've got to figure out what that purpose is and what your skills are and apply them. So I don't think that people that come from where I come from or here or anywhere else don't have an opportunity to move up. But you can't take no for an answer. Do you know how many times I've been knocked down in my lifetime? But my, my family always told me, you pick yourself up and you move on. And you know, the key is when you knock on a door enough, they, they get so aggravated with you, they'll let you in. And that's some of what we have to teach our young people, a growing economy and, by the way, we all believe in local control of education. We've got to make sure our schools are performing. Not based on some title or some headline. How are they doing? How are the results? How do they compare with the rest of the country? You've got to give our young people skills. And I think you also have to break the agrarian model. Everybody learns a little differently. Now if I want to be, say I like math, okay, if I could go and work for this guy for three hours a week and understand what BAE Systems does, I'm going to get energized. When I was a kid I used to like to go up into the courthouse and listen to lawyers argue. Surprise, I became a politician, right? But I mean the fact is is that having a flexible education and for those that don't want that academic approach we ought to have vocational education so that we can meet the skills of where people are. A growing economy, more skills, better education, a can-do attitude, resilience, and a little bit of faith. That's what I would say will work. Yes, sir, right here. Specifically, how are you going to fix the Affordable Care Act? Well, I, I think it's a bad law because it doesn't do what it was supposed to do, which is to lower the price of health care. Now, in my state, we have taken uh, Medicaid from a growth of 10 percent when I came in, and my second budget was at 2 percent without taking anybody off the rolls and without cutting any benefits. It's pretty, pretty amazing. But we have a program in Ohio where we think the primary care doctor ought to be the shepherd. We ought to have a medical home run by our primary care doctor who can move us through the challenges that we have with our health, dealing with insurance companies and with providers. Now we have a program in Columbus where the children's hospitals have made an agreement with the insurance company. The children's hospital works to keep kids healthy who have asthma. See, asthma is a leading cause of why kids are hospitalized. So if we can keep you healthy without putting you in the hospital, that's great, isn't it? And secondly, it means the hospital gets less revenue, 
but it means the insurance company gets more profit. Guess what? They share the benefit of keeping that kid healthy and out of the hospital. That's the way we should be running health care in our country. It shouldn't be based on quantity, it should be based on quality. You go to the hospital tonight, God forbid, they'll give you 10 tests when you only need two. And you don't really care because you're not paying for it. Somebody else is, some third party. So if we can move towards quality medicine, if we can move to a system that's designed to reward doctors to keep us healthy rather than treating us when we're sick, I think we'll have a better health care system, we'll have more control, and we'll be able to let the market, the free market work by doing this if you incentivize the right people with market forces. Yes, sir, right over there. Yes, um, Governor Pete Burdett from Bo. I wanted to um, ask you about the team you're going to build when you become the president. Uh, what kind of cabinet, uh, what type of person for being the, um, the vice president uh, will you, how will you gather folks around you to, to run all of this? Are you, you, you live in New Hampshire? Yes. Would you be available for vice president? Absolutely. <laughs> I'll give you my card before I leave. <laughs> wow. I, I was thinking about you as being ambassador to Middle Volta. Um, let, let me tell you, that is a very big part of being uh, a leader. First of all, if you come to my state and you come in to look at problems that we have, it's not unusual to find 20 people in a room with me. and. Um, what I encourage is open dialogue, tell me what's really on your mind, and come up with solutions that are creative. Don't come in here with a bunch of the same old, same old. When you're president, you've got to have good advisors, you've got to have a good cabinet. Your cabinet's got to be committed to job creation and common sense. But you also have, have to have people in the inner circle who you trust, who are not subjected just to group think. People that, and you need to be out there. See, one of the things I would like to do is I'd like to shift a lot of programs back to the states. I think you could run a welfare program better than the people in Washington can. I think you can run a better program for, to deliver health care to the poor than they can in Washington. I think you can do a better job of educating your children by having a lot of those monies and influence and strings shift up where you live. And then all we got to do is be held accountable for what we do with it. As president, I'd like to travel to all the legislatures around the country on a regular basis and hear what's working. What's unique in Massachusetts you could learn here? Or what do you have here that we could learn in Illinois? Best practices always works. And then the federal government ought to stop preventing states from being creative and innovative. We should have a clearinghouse to give people the reasons to be able to do things better to serve the public. And then when it comes to defense, you have to have military leaders who will tell you the truth, that don't take care of their own little rice bowl, and what do I mean by that? I have a friend who was once the COO of the CIA. And, um, you know, I ask him some questions, and the questions that he gives me are counterintuitive to what I think he's going to tell me. He's got a lot of credibility with me. Because you've got to have direct and, and, and uh, answers that make sense that are not, cre you know, not reflecting just your own personal gain or personal interests. And then you need civilian leaders, too, who are experts in defense. But at the end of the day, the president has to have the right instincts, the right experience, the right gut. Um, that's how it works. It's how it works as governor of Ohio. Now, I got to tell you, I was a congressman, and now I'm a governor. There's not that much difference, only the difference between day and night, okay? And so I am constantly being faced with decisions that I have to make. I have a good staff, but you know what? At the end of it, at the end of the day, it's on me. And at the end of the day, it's on me, and then you judge how I do by the results. Sounds it's like not theory. It's not theory. It's not theory. It's results. And do you make some mistakes? Of course you do. But, you know, you keep it moving in the right direction. And, uh, and you respect the people that put you in office, too. Uh, you know, when I get elected, I'm a CEO, basically, and I assemble a team so I can run the company as best as I possibly can. Okay, hey, listen, uh, they're telling me i got to go and everybody's got to go, so here's what I would say. If you're interested, check us out. If you want to do something like this that's not as magnificent, that's fine, okay? Maybe we can come to your house. I'm doing town halls. I'd really like you to help me up here, and I'll say this about New Hampshire. This is a great system. People say, why do you like it so much there? I said, two congressional seats, 
you can get throughout the entire state and people will look at you and they will listen to you and they'll look into your eyes and they'll feel what you're all about and if they like you they'll reward you and if they don't well then they just don't it just you didn't you didn't connect and it wasn't the right time you know when I was here 16 years ago they said you know we like you it's not your time so maybe you in New Hampshire this time can make it my time so thank you God bless Do you want to finance? For your own event? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want one of those too? You missed the K6 stickers. They went pretty fast, actually. They did? Yeah. We're all out of them already. How are your daughters? Yeah, you told me about them last time. At the dine event. Thank How you. old are you? I'm 17. I'm Darren Cusack's daughter. That's right. You're yeah. volunteer. Every time I see you, I should know you. I've only seen you 50 times, right? <laughs> yeah. How I is guess this I'm... literature? It, it was good. I read it. There's a nice picture of you with really nice hair. Where is it? Right there. What's wrong with that <laughs> hair? It's better than Donald Trump's hair. How's your daddy doing? He's doing well. I is think he here? I hope he's coming. My mom's here, but okay. I think he'll be coming. Nice to see you again. Nice Thank, Thank you. I hope you win. How's school going? Uh, it started last week. I had like eight hours of homework last night so I could do this event tonight. <laughs> you could sign me a note to get me out of all my history homework. She, uh, she is a number. She is. So what are we doing for her to put, boost her up a little bit? Can I just oh, cut this out? I got the autograph now. <laughs> Can we have any? We have anything special? See, it's a long. We got a long, okay. long road. So, yeah, we do. You know, okay. can't just reward her right at the beginning. No, that's right. Yeah. You, that's but right. I'd love Good to point. Help with anything at all. Good point. How are you, Governor? I'm Alan Blake. Glassman, Dunlap oh, County. Yeah. I know Alan. I just saw you. <laughs> um, so we got to get her one of my books. Oh, yeah. We'll do that. Okay. Governor Hi, Rich. Sorry. Yeah. Good nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you again. Nice to see you. This is our Welcome. son, Sam. Sam, how are you? We're gonna, we're gonna bring you in the house. Uh, there's about 100 people around that corner. Okay. okay. Good. So, uh, I hope you're in shape. In what? I hope you're in shape for this. For what we're gonna be doing? Wrestling, I'm everybody. Running for president. Yeah. I'm running for president. Yeah. You know, it's. Ken, you're not leaving. Darwin. Hey, Darwin. Hey, Darwin. Come here, Berkey. You know him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. My good friend Jay Flanders. Hi. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How are you? Yeah. I think I'm not sure which group these people. Are. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Governor. Nice to meet you. Nice Welcome to see you. Hampshire, my wife, Kathy. Kathy. And his wife, Kathy. How are you? Great Americans. You look well. Good. A lot of people this. here. Yeah. Uh, Rich will uh, yeah. will introduce you. Yeah, thanks for seeing He's the host by. with the most. I said hello to your better half. Yeah, yeah. So let me grab you two seconds. Okay. Oh, good. You're going to have a meeting before the meeting. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I... So, Enjoy. <laughs> okay, where are we going to go to do this? Where do you want me to well, go? Come in. You're going to say hi to everybody here, and then we're going to have get my picture taken with you. Sure. Okay. I'm Amanda yeah. Sabrowski, and I. Thank you. Thank you. John's a former state rep. Former yeah. state rep, three terms. Okay. You're in my top tier, Governor. <laughs> okay. Good to hear. Thank you, John. All right. Yeah. Meet the Burns right over here. Hi. Hi. How are you? Nice to meet you, Governor. How are you? Nice to meet you, Governor. How are you? Welcome. What do you do, Tim? Sometimes. Work for BAE Systems. Oh, good. Time, yes. Small company there. Yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah. 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 Great. Shabbers. Shabbers, say hi. Hi. How are you? Very nice, nice to meet you. Hi. Hi. Nice, nice to meet you. you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Who are you yelling at? The, yeah, so Steve, well, you've heard of a, of a company called Sig Sauer. They make fine handguns here in New Hampshire. Okay. Yeah. Steve is their the general counsel. Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. Good. Who are these ladies back here? Yeah, one yes. of them. That's smart. Hi. Hi. How are you? Nice to see you. How's everything? Good. Nice good. to see you. Glad to see you. Some neighbors. This is Super. Very nice to meet Hi. you. Hi, Carol Susie, the were, neighbor. You were so shy, you wouldn't come up <laughs> Way up here. Put her on TV. You're shy. I am. And you're blushing. <laughs>
Yeah. This is Lee and Marcia, one of your supporters. I know her. You know yes. her. We are I know. You're on your way back. And this is Ken Foote. This is Sue's husband. How you doing? Another nice to meet shy you. guy. You? He's not shy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's a part of this thing your, from yeah. shy, right? Yeah. So All let's, right. Let's step right up. Okay. okay. We'll step come past, right say hi as we go. Oh, yeah. Can I get a picture before I get started? Oh, yeah. Can I do yeah. it? It better be idiot proof. Hold on. Nice. Excellent. Thank Excellent. you. Hi. Nice to meet you. Terry. Yeah. Terry. Sanders. Terry, what do you do? Um, I'm in advertising. Good. Yeah. Most uh -huh. of you. It's going pretty well. Yeah. Most you importantly, like she's our neighbor yes. who lives on the hill and is letting us have this party. <laughs> oh, we're calling the police. <laughs> Oh, well, you don't, the rock band will be arriving in about an hour, so. I was kind of hoping. Fireworks, yes. <laughs> Who do you like? Um, rock bands? Yeah. Oh, well, pretty much all of them. Do you? If they're rock, yes. Yeah, if they're rock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Meet Paul yes. Manser. Governor. Paul, nice how are you? Yeah. And then I want you to meet Joe Moore. Governor. Hi, Joe. Joe. It's my wife, Janet. Hi, Governor. Hi. Janet. Welcome Bedford. to New Hampshire. What happened to you? Rotator cuff, sir. <laughs> oh, <laughs> rotator cuff surgery. Oh, rotator cuff. So how did you do that? Uh, slow miles in the body, sir. <laughs> I mean, was there a moment? There was no moment. Just wear and tear. <laughs> so I'm having a little problem with my arm. Uh, take care of it. I don't yeah. want to have a rotator. No, oh, how, how long have you been in this? Uh, six weeks oh. and uh, three to four months of PT. Wow. I know. It's not, it's not, it's so, it's such one of the toughest things to recover from. So you have to creep your hands up. The, yes, how's that going? Slowly. Yeah. <laughs> how are you, Governor? Good. Good to see you. Good to see you. Speaker right here. How are you? Very Nancy? good. Yes. Come on, give me a big hug. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. We're, but this is me. I have to bail hay. I have to bail hay. You right. earned it. Yeah. Hi, Ann Smith. Great yeah. to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. Swing this way. So you can't win Manchester without the Vatisons. Uh oh. I want you to get that straight. Right. How are you? Yeah, great longtime Governor. activist. Let me get a picture. Mike Smith and okay. Humphrey way back when you were in the realm. Oh, yeah. That way yeah. I'll be to Bob blame. and, and Gordon. Yeah. 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 What were you doing? A staff doing assistant. Doing where? <laughs> in D.C.? No, Manchester. Okay. My uh, son worked in D.C. You know, okay. I, I walked into get a thousand uh, people here. Thank to you. Kelly's Senate office, yeah. and there were staffers in there. And I walked in and I said, I've got to tell you, I have really a big complaint and I want to see the senator now. <laughs> and, and they were like, oh, well, she's in Washington. I said, that's a likely story. They're always in Washington when you have a serious problem. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people. And then I wrote a note and I said, give this to the senator, please. <laughs> But she gave me. Her, she she get, know who you were? No, I didn't tell him. I just was an angry New Hampshire yeah. constituent. <laughs> You're welcome. Governor Mike Hagemans. Megan, Hi. nice to meet Megan. you. Megan. Newly Chase Hageman. Two months. New, newly Can we get a selfie with you with the newlyweds? Yeah. Sure. All right. Yeah. So. so <laughs> newlyweds. <laughs> Nice wow. You. But I'm also here to warn you, Chase runs the Concord Coalition. Yeah. And I guess we do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Nothing wrong with that. Just hit the screen. Yeah. Nice. And what do you, you do? Looks awesome. I'm a criminal prosecutor. <laughs> <laughs> you are with that smile and all that, huh? That's why she wins. <laughs> and where did you go to school? I went to UNH okay. school. Law. Yeah, and for law school too. Yes. Okay, great. And you do what? I'm also an attorney, but I work with the Concord Coalition. Okay. So uh, we uh, we're actually working on first budget right now, which is to get candidates like you to talk about uh, fiscal issues. Good. I, you know, I've, I've hardly ever spoken to him in my life. I know. <laughs> you see us everywhere. I'm just learning. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi, so I met your dad. Yes. I got my picture Hi. taken. Hi, John. I'm from Ohio, too. You are? Hello. Welcome to New Hampshire. Where are you from in Ohio? Akron. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you get here? I got married. Um, okay. I got carried away. <laughs> and so you never look back. You ever go back? Just when my folks were still there. Yeah. yeah I, was, uh, I was born and raised there, and when I was 23, we moved to Buffalo. And then Pittsburgh, and now New Hampshire. Where'd you live in Pittsburgh? Uh, Murraysville, yeah. near Monroeville. Yeah, because yeah, I'm from the Keys Rocks. Oh, are you? We have, yeah. We have a daughter in Pittsburgh. Is that right? Does yeah. she like it? Oh, yeah. What does she do? She's a nurse practitioner. Her Good. Husband, her husband's which, a doctor. Which, uh, She's at, um... Allegheny General? Yeah, he's at, he's, um, chief of surgery at Allegheny General. Really? He left from UPMC. And she's at um, Women's and McGee, which is still part of UPMC. She's a nurse. Well, Allegheny General is one of the greatest trauma hospitals we have in the country, oh, in the world. 
And he's the chief of surgery? He's an esophageal specialist. Wow, oh, man. So if you have yeah, any we'll problems with <laughs> acid reflux, go yeah. to Pittsburgh and Allegheny. Gotcha. I got gotcha. you. Meet the Symbors. <laughs> 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 Have I met you before? No. No? I swear I did. I, I was trying to do one of my famous hook shots, and you rejected it, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> like, no. Did you play? Please tell me. Just high school. Just high school, but I grew up about three miles from you. Where? Brentwood. Really? Did and you? our dads worked together, I'm pretty sure. My dad worked at the post office. Where? Uh, he was postmaster in Pittsburgh. Sim yeah, see, my father was in McKees Rocks. Yeah, yeah. So he didn't. But that whole greater Pittsburgh area yeah. fell under his wing. Wow. And I think your well, mother. How come he never got picked uh, mailman of the week? <laughs> that was your father. I and my know. mother did work there did for a she? while. Yeah, she was there before computers when they did these things called schemes, and they had to memorize all these zip codes and all that, yeah. I just can remember. And my father would go and pick my mother up late at night, and I was always really worried that one time my dad would pick my mom up and they would never make it home. And then guess what? They were killed in a car accident oh, many years boy. later oh, by a drunk driver. Oh, I yeah. But but I, I became a better man through all that, as, tra as tragic as it is. We, had a, we have a young guy working on our uh, campaign. He travels around with me. This morning, he got a call from his, uh, from his mother. His grandfather didn't wake up last night, so we sent him, we sent him home. And it, he's 22 years old and crying. And, you know, I said, it's okay, kid, you know. That's the way to go. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely that. I, you know, or it would, for me it would be like picking an apple off of a tree on the 18th hole once I beat my friend in golf and that would be just great, so believe me. Hi. Hey, Dave, Dave Pezzi, how are you? Dave, nice, nice to, to meet you. used to work for a senator named Sununu. All right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. It was, I was a very junior staffer, so we didn't interact when we were on the old together, but admired you, uh, yeah, nice you know, you. From, you. The, from, the, uh, from the back row, so to speak. Right, thanks. So good to see you here. It's good to see John, too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Meet Jim Otto and Nancy. Hi. Good, great Hi. activists Hi. from Hampton. Okay. So we get yeah. Yeah. great. Yeah. We got the coast covered too. So what what makes you an activist? You raise cane with people or what? No, no, no. Picking a good candidate and Is standing right? behind him. That's right. Yeah. That's why we're over uh, here listening. Good. You know Doug Scammon? Yes. No, he yeah. Is, yeah. He may give you a little advice on picking a good candidate. <laughs> to him, would you? Doug Horrocks. Have nice I met you before? You. No. You look like my cousin Harry. Carol you have a twin. He's a tall, handsome guy. Pleasure huh? to meet you. Well, yeah, and married to a much younger woman, too. Oh. Yeah. Brought my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> he has my vote. Yeah. This yeah. way. Steve William Howard Scott. Welcome to the Hampshire. John Black. Nice to meet you. Hi. Do you all know him? Oh, yes. yes. I mean, how do you disavow all Why do you have this many friends? Huh? <laughs> or maybe they're not. It's all you. When I get done, they may not be your friends. Let's move on to the family. My I'm sis. sister Mary Lou. Nice to meet you. Mary Lou, how are you? <laughs> sister Barbara. I have a big sister who needs to be on a step. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Barbara, my daughter. Hi. And you are? Richard's niece. Okay, now, so what was it like having an older brother that you? I don't know. He's the He's baby. over there. <laughs> the older brother's in there. There are seven No, of us. when you get a compliment, you say thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We're used to beating up on him, you know? What is, what is, your, what is the Lebanese? Lebanese. Yeah. Fantastic. Meet Selma, Beautiful. who's like a sister. Absolutely. Nice to meet you. Okay. Are you Lebanese also? I am certainly yeah. that. Do we have a lot of Lebanese in New Hampshire? Well, um, in, in Manchester we do. Only, yeah. a, yeah. only a senator, a former senator, a uh, former governor. <laughs> Her um, husband, the yeah. mayor. Everyone who's Lebanese, please stand up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No. Meet Jeff. He wishes he was living here. <laughs> yeah. Jeff Degler. Hi. My daughter, Emily. Emily. How old are you, Emily? Come on, I'm 19. 19? Yeah. What are you doing? Going to school? Yeah, I'm at Bentley University. All right. What are you taking? Um, looking towards management. For what? Management. Okay. Good for you. Yeah. There's a little company here maybe you could manage someday. <laughs> BAE yeah. system. We'll, we'll all be working. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good. Now, the, the high school you girls... Have other, you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I have two younger brothers. And uh, what do they do? High school? Um, ben is a freshman. He's at Emerson okay. College in Boston. Yeah. And Zach's still in elementary school. El elementary school. Okay, how do you treat him? <laughs> as kindly as I can. <laughs>
I have twin daughters that are 15 and a half. <laughs> yeah, they're doing great. They're doing great. I mean, they're, they're doing just fantastic. They really are. They're just doing fantastic. So they're, uh, you know, they're just they're just so much fun, and they're they're growing up to be beautiful. Both going to be driving at the same they, time. They, uh, that's why I'm glad I'm in New Hampshire today. Okay. Because gotcha. they're driving in Ohio. Now, my my wife is kind of. They're doing, they're doing very, very, very well, which I'm, I'm really pleased about. So I'll tell you a funny story. So my daughters, after their second day of school, I get home, and, they, and Reese says, Daddy, I want to, uh, we want to tell you about our first day of school. Uh, why don't we go have some ice cream? I said, okay. I said, okay, I'll buy. And, uh, and Reese says, okay, I'll drive, Daddy. So we drive to the ice cream store. And she says, and we'll drive home, you know, so I'm, this is really interesting. So we're, we're having our ice cream, and I said, now girls, because my daughters are beautiful little girls, tall, they're not little girls, they're nice and tall and pretty, and their mother is really beautiful too. So I said, you know, we're going to have this thing with boys. And they start kind of giggling, and I said, look, if you have any question with boys, you've got to talk to your mother, because your mother really knows how to guide you on that. And you know what my 15-year-old daughter said to me? But Daddy, you have good instincts, so we want your opinion too. <laughs> when did you ever oh, hear that? Politicians. Huh? Politicians. No, no, I mean that's what she said to me. I know. They're you think politicians, she was? Oh, you those think girls. you think she yes. was? <laughs> yes. I thought she was sincere. Okay. <laughs> Who do we have here? I'm Charlotte Sinudo. Nice oh, you are? Yes. <laughs> really? Yes. I'm Opposite. We're hot, but I know I've been away. But really? Yes. So you know you have some freckles. Yes, I do. I've been getting some. Stuff. You know what they say? <laughs> no, I don't. They say a girl without freckles is like a night without stars. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Huh? Oh, lovely. We love your mom and dad. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> so how old are you? Um, I'm turning 16 in a week. Okay. Yes. A week and a half. Very and good. who who got your friends here? My friend Maya. Hi, Maya. Who lives in lovely house. Oh, that's your daughter. <laughs> so are you like good buddies or what? Yeah, we've been friends for a little while. Yeah, a little yeah. while. Like 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So do you do sleepovers and? Oh yeah, the whole night. Still? You still? Still, yeah. Yeah. So you got your you're gonna have your license soon. Yes. Much to my parents' disappointment. Are you excited about that? I'm very excited to drive. And how's your brother doing? He's doing well. He couldn't make it tonight, but he's getting Where, ready for grad school. Yeah, he's, I thought he was. So he's in grad school. He's starting grad school next okay. year. Yes. And he went to Yale. Yes, he just graduated. Very excited. Probably couldn't get into Ohio State. Yeah. No, I'm just <laughs> So we met Nikki. Hi, Governor. Yeah, Chris Juris, all good to meet you. Hi, Chris, nice to see you. Hi. Hi. My, my Gail Fisher is his sister in law. Okay. Well, you, you forced everybody in the family. Oh, yeah. what do you, you get it right? I mean, you're. Bill Ganim and Richard is my cousin. Okay. Hi. Nancy Nassar. Nancy Nassar. Nancy. How are you? I'm Skip, the older brother. Yes, the older brother. <laughs> the oldest brother. Yes. But you know, uh, I tell you the funny thing is, I went for a walk when we landed. And I walked way up the street and then way down and I walked the side street and then we came out and we were getting ready to drive over here and there were there were about six people standing outside this building and I thought well I'll walk over and really surprise them and then I forgot we were in New Hampshire. I said hi I'm I'm John Kasich I'm running for president of the United States. They're like oh yeah yeah nice to see you. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it was like no, it was like absolutely no surprise. So I told, so I was on a plane the other day going to California, and this I was talking to this couple. I didn't know them, and I was sitting on the aisle, thank goodness, and they were next to me. We were asking, what do you do, what do you do, what do you do? And they said, and what do you do? Oh. And I said, how about if I let you know what I do when the pilot says we're about to land? <laughs> And then when we landed, I looked at the, you know, the, the, the uh, wife. I said, well, you know, I'm the governor of Ohio, and I'm running for president. She said, now tell us the truth. Come on, <laughs> in, in New Hampshire, they would say, well, okay, so yeah. what? What else yeah. do you do in your spare time? <laughs> what else do you do? Hello. Okay. <laughs> do you do the, does it explode? Uh. <laughs> How old are you? Um, 13. And why are you here? I'm with Miss did, did she make you come? That's not true. I got home from work and he had the shirt on. He said, so I hear you're going to see a candidate tonight. Are you exactly. still going? Can I come along? 
great. Excellent. So what do you want to be when you grow up? Because you're already figuring this out, aren't you? Sure. What are you thinking? You can be honest. Not sure. Ruler of the world. Ruler of the world? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Who do we got back you here? Know have, do you know each other? You no. no. Lawrence Klein. Nice to see you. Worked for Eversource. Used to be in media before that. Married to Drew Klein, the union leader. Okay. Yeah. He's home with the kids. He's, He's doing the dirty work. Yeah. Today. So Voss is here. And yeah. who do we have here? Yeah. And this is Janine, State Rep Janine. Oh. Hi. I'm from Matt, Merriman. You went before. Yeah. And who, who is this? This is my youngest son, Blaze. And Blaze, how old are you? Fourteen. Okay, Blaze. Oh, oh. This is Peter. He wanted to meet you. So. Peter. Right. Nice Both sons? Um, well, they're best friends since kindergarten. Okay. So, how old are you guys? 14. 14. And uh, how school? We start school nope. tomorrow? Nope, not until next week. So, we still get to have fun this week. Wow. My kids started school, I think, about three weeks ago, maybe almost a month ago. And I said, girls, this is like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. How can you start school at this, you know, on this date? And they looked at me and said, Daddy, you're the governor. Yeah, about that. Yeah. So. Can I get their picture with Sure. Do you want to get it? Do you want to be in? Um, okay. Well, oh, yeah. no, just them. I don't mean to twist her arm. But they want to be in. Oh, I got it. All right, well, then you on, do. Guys. Okay. You know, nothing like best friends. <laughs> Okay, stick up for one another. Before you leave, this is our state rep corner, apparently. Yeah, we're all together. Terry Wolf, Dave Daniels, and Guy. Hello, we're both from Bedford. Okay. On the education committee. Are you? I'm fine. Okay, how's it going? Great. As soon as the governor signs the budget. Is that coming soon? Well, we're going to have a... Yeah, we're going to have a meeting next, uh, two weeks from tomorrow. So just everything is just on hold? They're negotiating. Yeah. But we have an override meeting on uh, two weeks from tomorrow. I don't know why she did what she did. It doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Hi. Meet Bill Malloy. Bill Malloy. Yeah. Governor, nice to meet you. What do you do, Bill? I'm a retired Navy, and I worked for BAE at, uh, with Rich Great. for a while. What do you do? I uh, fish. I hunt. <laughs> yeah. I work out. I read. Pay attention to politics a lot. Yeah, That's pretty good. <laughs> Governor, nice to meet you. Yes. Welcome to New Hampshire. It's worth the call. Hi. Hi. How are you? Very nice. And what is this one? What is the one? Do you mean the one campaign? We're the New Hampshire we're the New chapter. Hampshire. So oh, for thank, you for, New Hampshire. thank you for having us. We, we appreciate it. We appreciate you. Rick I didn't know you were coming. Oh, all right. Well, your people might have known, but Rick set it up. And, uh, good. So, yeah, no, but we, we like understand Bono. that you're, yeah, you understand that you, you know Bono, that you're a friend of one. And, you were back. You were in D.C. back when PEPFAR was first started, which yeah. is the impetus. So, I was. so yeah, exactly. yeah. So. so how's Bono doing? Is he coming to see you all? Well, we went to see him when he was in the at, in the the garden in Boston. Oh, how so was we, it? We, we, oh, it was awesome. It was awesome. We we volunteered and collected signatures for the petitions. Well, did you go to the show? Oh yeah, we, we worked for a couple <laughs> hours and we got to uh, we got to we were there for sound check and then after working for about four hours, then we saw the show and just went crazy. Couldn't speak the next day. It was, was that right? Yeah. It was worth it. So you like the U2 music? I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. And, I, and we really like what one what Bono has started. So That's yeah, great. we really work hard. Well, you know, the story is is that uh, I was really the first guy to spend time with Bono on the Capitol Hill, and he got very frustrated because. He, we couldn't get enough meetings, and in early days, people didn't know much about U2, even though we all knew about U2. A lot of people didn't in Congress, because they don't know, you know. They don't know, yeah. They might not be as cool as you were. Got, got out, of, out of touch. So Bono says, you know, Bono, Bono says, John, I'm really frustrated that we can't get more meetings. I said, just look at you. You got on the leather suit. The Prada shoes and the goofiest sunglasses I've ever seen. A lot of these people don't want to be seen with you. And he looked at me and he said, you know, the guys in my band, they're not too thrilled about me being seen, being seen with you. So the feeling was mutual. So anyway, thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We're going to get rolling? Yeah, let's Whoever roll. Who did you met? Everybody. Oh, Pete Derrick. Speaking of one. Got her. Global Janina. leadership. Yeah. 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 yeah, we have. So now we get the internationally budget. That's right. Okay. So I'm here to step back. Okay, but I don't want to fall over the railing. Do not fall over the railing. <laughs> that would be bad. That would be a heck of a story. Okay. Governor, you're appealing to the same voters as Jeb, but you're gaining in the polls and he's sliding in the polls, particularly here in New Hampshire. What are you doing that's different than Jeb? Well, I, you know, I like Jeb. It's just I'm me, so I'm just being John Kasich and hopefully having a little fun and 
you know, I, I, you have to figure that out. But I'm, I'm enjoying myself. You could, t I hope you could see that tonight. I mean, I feel passionately about a lot of these issues. Uh, I feel deeply about many of them, and uh, I hope it came through tonight. And this is what we'll continue to do, whether it's town halls where I got a couple tomorrow, and. Being here at this house party, which is just like a town hall, is pretty pretty amazing. Okay, uh -huh. Governor, the rhetoric is drifting increasingly rightward on uh, legal immigrants. Now your colleagues are talking about building a wall uh, to keep Canada out. What do you think about that? I don't think we need a wall in Canada. I mean, look, I've been. Well, what do you think about the way candidates are answering oh, I, questions I, about I, legal I don't, immigrants? I don't. I can. I can only answer questions for me, and you'll have to determine what you think about the other ones. You know, my position is build the wall down south, finish it, and then once it's done, anybody who comes across is going to have to go back. No excuses. You're going back. Uh, good guest worker program, and, uh, you know, 11 or 12 million that are here, if they haven't violated the law, uh, they're, going to have to, they're going to have to pay a penalty, maybe do a little service, assimilate, uh, and then they can reach legalization, legal status here in the U.S. And then I think the whole visa program really needs to be looked at. Uh, but in terms of Canada, you know, I, I don't know, I have not heard. I think whoever suggested it, I think, is backed off. Governor, what do, you, do you have any reaction to the added criteria for the CNN debates coming up? I've never even heard of them. Carly Am Florida I in? might be on the stage now. Well, it would be great. Am I in? I don't know yet. <laughs> okay, well, that's all I know. I, we'll have to see. Got time for one more. Governor, you've been, Ohio was sued by uh, Planned Parenthood over the abortion restrictions. It seems like this issue just is not going to go away on the campaign trail. Um, they're saying that they would be forced to close under the law yeah, look, you signed look, look, okay. uh, in the, Southwest yeah, Ohio. There'd be no abortion yeah. clinics. Look, the bottom is line is, first of all, I'm pro-life with the exceptions of rape, incest, and life of the mother. And we, be I believe in family planning. And uh, but I don't think it has to go through Planned Parenthood. Frankly, I think whether you're pro-choice or pro-life, I think what we've seen here, these revelations, have. Uh, Everybody's turned off by them. So there's other ways to do effective family planning without having to go through them. Thank okay. you. Governor, Thank you all. Governor, the uh, Bush we'll campaign, you guys um, you're rolling the dice on New Hampshire. As we head into Labor Day, how do you think you're positioned? Well, I, who's saying this? Bush campaign. I don't have any comment. <laughs> Thank you. I'm the leading state sponsor of terrorism.